John chapter 17, we'll read verse 6. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is speaking to his own disciples here. Judas Iscariot is left out, however. And Jesus Christ, he gives a, uh, he gives a final speech, so to say, to his own disciples telling the importance of separating themselves from the world and what they've been called out to do. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus Christ warned his disciples to stay away from the world and that they are not of the world and that they are to be holy, clean, and sanctified. Notice that God's mission don't uh, mix up with the world. Jesus Christ made it very clear, I pray for them, but I don't pray for the world. That's pretty extreme. Jesus Christ said that they are not of the world. I am not of the world. Jesus Christ said they're out of the world that I called them out. So that is very important to Jesus Christ that God should not be mingled with the world. Nowadays, we live in a culture, in a generation, in a church day where everyone takes it as normal in the way they eat, they dress, they talk, what they watch, what they hear, the people they encounter, and they bring those things into the church. And is there something wrong? Well, if what you're used to is the worldly way of doing things, then absolutely. And that's why they'll bring worldly stuff into the church. Don't get me wrong, we can have a little fun here and there. But when people come to church because they know they will be entertained rather than spiritually fed, spiritually change their lives for Jesus Christ, then that is wrong. But unfortunately, nowadays, Bible believers may not be so much different from the worldly churches. You might think you're a Bible believer, or if you're new to the Bible-believing movement, you don't know much about that. But I believe that pretty much nearly all of us unconsciously have some of the things we're used to doing things into the world and apply that to God, to our walk with Jesus Christ, and to the church. And I want to tell you something, God and the world don't mix. They'll never mix. God is holy. He is sanctified. He is pure. The world is sin. It's fleshly. It's self-centered. They are the total opposites of each other. And that's what I would like to preach today. God and the world don't mix. Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit? It doesn't matter how much effort or sweat I put into this without you. Will you guide me and fill me? Fill within your speaker. May it have an effect upon the hearers. Whatever way that this sermon will come out, I entrust in your hands and help me to walk by faith, not by sight, not by result, not by my own ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. My first point is your position to the world. Your position to the world. Now, if you were to think about the disciples, sometimes I might say 11 or 12, I might go that way back and forth because Judas Iscariot is not really counted with that. But if I say 12, then just pardon me, it's just more used to saying it. So I might say 12 disciples sometimes, or 11, we'll see. But these 11 disciples, when they followed the Lord Jesus Christ, 
When they heard the words of John 17, that didn't sound extreme to them. If you brought the words of John 17 to a mega church nowadays, they would churn in their stomachs. They would feel uneasy. But to the disciples, that was not something that would bother them at all. You might say, why is that? Because at the very beginning... When they started and made the decision to become disciples themselves, they already knew that they would be separated from the world. I mean, you have to realize that these people are such extremists in separation from the world more than us Bible believers, even yours truly. You might say, how so? They are so much separated from the world that they were willing to give up their entire income. What would give food to their own family? Fishermen was all their occupation. Matthew, he was a tax collector. He made good money. But these men gave up everything that they had with their job. They forsook that and just followed Jesus Christ. They didn't hesitate. They didn't wait for a sermon and come down the altar. No, these men were hardcore extremists. I mean, when Jesus said, follow me, you read the passage, they straightway forsook their nets yes, yes. and followed him. These disciples are truly extremists in separating from the world. They gave up their job. They even left their own families to follow Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus Christ mentioned in one passage and the Simon, Simon Peter actually told Jesus Christ that, hey, we forsook uh, our family. We forsook all to follow you. They didn't care about their family, what they would think about it. They made sure that God's thinking and attention was more important than their own family members. I mean, they were extremists in separation. Imagine you, you had a wife and children and then you said, bye, all of a sudden. I don't encourage that, obviously. But my point is, these disciples were such extremists in separation, they were able to do that and leave to follow Jesus Christ. What's their future? Homelessness. Jesus Christ had no place to live in. Can you, uh, the disciples didn't go to Jesus and say, Hey, so uh, wh what are you going to plan for us in the, uh, when I follow you? I mean, uh, Jesus, uh, we're, we've been walking for many miles. Is there a hotel to stay? And Jesus said, right outside these doors, all right? Yeah. Outdoors, the great outdoors. Yeah. The rocks are your pillows. Let's sleep. Yeah. Homelessness. That's what they signed up for. These guys were extremists. In separating from the world, they were able to they don't care which place they lived in. Yeah. They were willing to sacrifice their own homes. They were able to go out to the great unknown where they have no money, no security, just complete faith in Jesus Christ. Where are we going to get the money? I don't just walk by faith, not by sight, Jesus would say. One disciple talks to another disciple. Hey, uh, so what do you think is going to happen the next couple of years? You know, are we going to have good security? I'm worried about my kids. They're growing up now. They're about to enter college. And uh, what are we going to do? About, I mean, are we going to always live our lives like this forever? How are we going? These disciples completely walked by faith in Jesus Christ and forsook their dreams and their future by complete faith wow. in following Him they didn't care. They didn't care. You talk about extremists and separation that none of us would probably qualify. These men didn't hesitate. They straightway did it. But us, uh, even yours truly, I'll admit if you told me to leave my family, leave everything that I have, my income, the place that I live in, I'd at least, you know, give me about a half a day to think about it and to ponder something, set my house in order, and I'm not ready for this. But the disciples, they were not like us. They were willing to straightway leave all and follow Jesus Christ. What would make them do something like that? where they can be such an extremist to separate from the world that when Jesus says in John 17, don't mix with the world, the disciples are like, no problem, Jesus, we already knew that a long time ago. Wow. What would make them do something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, I can notice a few things what Jesus mentioned at verse 8. Verse 8, why will they not be caught up with the world is, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely 
See that word? Surely that I came out from thee, and they have what? Believe that thou didst send me. I know why. It's because they believed. They believed when Jesus Christ told them, Hey, I'm the Messiah. Follow me. The disciples realized this is our future king who will set up a kingdom. Man, I don't care about my job and family and everything that I have. God, Jesus Christ is going to set everything up and I'm going to walk with God manifested in the flesh. They believe that so strongly. That's why it wasn't a problem. They didn't hesitate to leave everything they had. They straightway forsook their jobs to follow Jesus Christ because they believed that you're the Messiah. You could provide our needs if you wanted to. You will take care of my family and my children. Amen. You will take care of my future. You got it all under control. No problem. I will follow you, Jesus. Man, don't you recall back then when Jesus Christ told you, hey, follow me. Why don't you join uh, Bible Baptist Church? Hey, why don't you serve me? Why don't you get discipled right here? Don't you recall that time, my friend, that Jesus Christ, when he offered that to you and you had a belief that this is real. God will take care of me. God will provide my future. Oh, I have family issues. Oh, I have job issues. Oh, I have security issues. No, no, no. I believe in God that he'll resolve all of that. So coming to this church and studying up and being discipled and following Jesus Christ, not a problem. Do you remember when you had a belief like that? Or did you forget? Did you forget? Maybe that's why you have a hard time separating from the world. Right. You forgot what, who you believed in. Right. You forgot who you believed in. I know why the disciples were such extremists to separate from the world and follow Jesus Christ. They knew. They know too much. Right. And they're like, Jesus Christ, I mean, I know that that Pharisee and Sadducee ain't got nothing in the Bible. I don't want to go to their church and Jesus, you got all these doctrines uh, that no man has ever heard of before. What great authority. Wow, I'm so hungry and man, that stuff that I lived in, in the world, I know it's wrong. I know it's evil. It's a waste of time. It's vain. Compared to what I know from you, you've given me so much truth and you show me what is right and wrong. Now I got my doctrine right. I'm a real Bible believer. No problem, Jesus Christ. I separate from the world to follow you. Amen. You recall that time when Jesus Christ said, follow me. And then your eyes got open and you said, what? doctrine is this yeah. and you're like no I didn't get that from the Sadducee and Pharisee at mega church so and so down there in San Jose Santa Clara San Francisco whoa I'm getting so much fed and oh this is just great stuff and what I didn't know dressing that way is wrong and a sin I didn't know that music is wrong and a sin that came from what satanic voodoo no way oh I didn't know that saying those words is actually bad and I shouldn't talk that way as a Christian. Oh, those movies and, whoa, that, that's just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I got too much truth. I got too much holiness. I can't watch that stuff anymore. I mean, every time that I watch that stuff, every time that I hear that stuff, every time that I encounter those things in the world, I mean, I know too much that my heart's grieved now. I feel so uncomfortable. A point of no return. I can't go back to the world. I've been ruined. I know too much. And you can see that they knew too much at verse 7. Verse 7. Now they have what? Known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. They knew all. They knew too much. And when you know too much Bible-believing truth and you realize that that world's got nothing, it's vain, and why would I even compromise and bring a little bit of that with me? No, no, no. I know too much. It's wrong. Some of you who don't know, maybe you need to know. And when, you're, when your eyes get open, then you'll realize why this church practices separation from the world. And why we're not extremists, why we're not mean to do so. 
It's because we know so much now. Do you? Do you know? I know why the disciples, they were able to separate from the world so easily and they, were su and they did such extremes to doing that. It's because they heard God Almighty in the flesh speaking to them. This ain't Gene King preaching. This is God yeah. speaking yeah. to them. And then, I mean, those disciples, you, can't you imagine Simon Peter and James and John as they were doing fishing and then all of a sudden, you know, they heard Sadducee, Pastor so-and-so with doctor degree, THD, so-and-so, speaking about this, about exegesis versus eisegesis. And the original Hebrew says, and then they were so used to hearing that, and then... The smiles that they see with your best life now and God will bless you. Jesus loves you. And they were just so used to hearing that. And then all of a sudden they heard something else out there while they were fishing. Yep. A, a loud voice. Yep. A street preaching voice. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the disciples are like, wow, what is that? Yeah, it spoke with authority and that it stirred their heart and then they got conviction over their sin. This man preached against sin. This man preached on hell more than any other person in the Bible. This person made the love of God real, not just fake. This was the man that made a full difference that didn't care what culture, what society, what the way of the world said. He would speak anything that would go the opposite of what they said. Mm -hmm. And they hurt so much. And you know what? Simon, Peter, James, John, they probably had their own altar call. And they said, oh God, I repent and I separate this from the, uh, these wicked things of the world that I put in my life. And they got right with God. Yeah. You know why? They heard so much preaching from Jesus. If you're one of those 11 disciples, do you realize yeah. that relationship with Jesus Christ, how much they heard his words? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Heard him talking to them? How much words of God from Jesus speaking? That's his words, right? Jesus' word. So that's the word of God. Speaking to them and they have so much of that saturated in their mind and their heart that they can't go back to that world because they've been ruined. Yeah. They heard too much from what Jesus preached to them. And that sermon resounds in their ears. And you can recall you being that disciple too much preaching of God's word on how wicked the world is and how sin is a great crime against God and that Jesus Christ said he is real and that holy sanctified living is the way to live and what we have is the true authority we got the word of God in our hands I might not have the word of God Jesus Christ walking and talking with me but I got the word of God little w walking talking with me and as I keep reading and I keep hearing God speak to me every day as I'm a disciple of Jesus and every Sunday when I come to church and I hear him speaking to me and on Wednesday then you know what I'm like man how can I go back to the world after yes. that yes. how can I mix up some of the world after that I can't because I heard too much preaching and kept it in me. These disciples heard so much preaching from Jesus and kept it. Look, look at this verse at verse 6. Verse 6. I think there's your answer there. Jesus said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Jesus said at verse 6, I manifested thy name. See, Jesus Christ made them hear all of that. The last part of verse 6, Jesus Christ said they kept his word. That's why the disciples can't go back. They kept the word of God. They had the word of God. They were talking to the word of God. They heard so much of the word of God. They applied the word of God. They got right. Changed their lives because of the word of God. It's too much inside them. Their position to the world is very extreme in separation. They can easily do that. Why? Because they had the Word of God in their hearts. 
your position to the world would perhaps maybe not be that extreme as the disciples, but can you imagine if you had something a little bit of what they got, how much more distant the world would be to you right. rather than closer? Yeah. If you really had that much belief on Jesus Christ to begin with. If you had that much knowledge of what God told you. If you had that much experience and encounter with His Word being preached and spoken to you. I wonder how much more distant you will be from the world. Okay. Is that maybe why the world is closer to you because you've forgotten your belief, right. your hearing of the Word of God, and yeah. your knowledge. Mm -hmm. My second point is your prayer to the world. Your prayer to the world. Now look at verse 9, all right? Now this is a wonderful, loving statement by Jesus Christ. Imagine if I said this at the World Economic Forum. Yeah. I pray for them, I pray not for the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mean thing to say. I mean, uh, as Bible believers, because we know too, too much, we could probably go amen, but let, let, just, uh, like, you know, just follow along with me, all right? Let's try to be fair, all right? Yeah. That's kind of mean <laughs> that Jesus would go, I pray for my disciple, I don't pray for this world. And you're like, well, you know, Jesus, I mean, you kind of do it because don't you want souls to get saved? Don't you want them to get right with you? I mean, Poverty, starvation, crime to rise around this world. I mean, that's a kind of a mean thing to say. Why would you say something like that? Well, because Jesus knows one clear thing that you don't. When you think something like that, that's unfair. I mean, don't you want something good to come out of the world or the world to get saved, the world to be brought to God? And you see what you're doing? You're combining God and the world. Yep. Yep. You think the God and the world mix, that they can click, that somehow you can bring the two together. How can you bring polar opposites yep. to some kind of midway thing? You can't. You cannot do that, no matter how long you pastor, no matter how long you beseech or witness or try new programs or cultural adaptation. You cannot do that! Right. Because Jesus Christ knows that God and the world don't mix. That's why he can have the heartlessness to say, I don't pray for the world, but you do. Why? Because deep down inside the heart, there's something in there. You're praying for that world. You're praying for that world. Somehow, I mean, they can be brought to God and somehow uh, I can work things out with the world and God and they don't mix. Right, right. They don't mix. Notice in Luke 14, all right? Uh, keep your hand at John 17. Look at Luke 14. Notice that Jesus strongly had this in mind about... Praying not for the world when you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because who is Jesus speaking to? He's speaking, he's not speaking to the World Economic Forum. If he did that, maybe it would be worded differently, but this is speaking to his disciples here. And he's saying, hey, I'm speaking to you guys. Why? Because you're my disciples. So if you're a disciple and you're serious about it, you got to realize I don't pray for the world. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? If you are, then Jesus Christ is probably telling you right now, hey, I'm not praying for the world. Are you? Notice how he takes discipleship seriously in no prayer for the world. Look at this. You know why? Look at Luke chapter 14, verse 26. The Bible reads here, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. Well, the 11 disciples already knew that. You still struggle with that. Yeah. But the disciples already knew, hey, this is what I signed up for. 
in separation from the world. Okay, we can see that the context here is discipleship, correct? The context here is discipleship. Now look what he gives. He gives a parable, a story that will match up with the context. Look at verse 16. Then said he unto him, verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. The world. His attachment is on the world. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee to have me keep that world, that piece of ground. Wow, this person right here is praying for the world. Yeah. This person's praying for the world. Lord, let me keep this thing right here. And I, I, the person never said, I reject you, Jesus. Notice right here, the person never said, hey, I will not follow you. No, he just said, let me keep this. Yeah. Let me keep this. You know what people are doing? They, are, uh, they sign up for discipleship and they never say no to God or reject Him, but they're like, I pray thee, Lord. Let me keep this yeah. in my life. I pray for the world, Lord. I pray for the world. Look at the next passage. Notice Jesus sure had this in mind. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Again. Jesus knew that these people, they were praying for the world. Why do you think Jesus looked at his disciples later on and said, Hey, I want to tell you one thing. I pray for you. I don't pray for the world. Why do you think he said that to his 11 disciples? He could have said that a long time ago somewhere else, but why, are, why is he addressing the disciples? And why did he say that at that time? Because the context is discipleship. He says, if you're going to be my disciple and follow me, there's one thing I want you to get in your heads. I don't pray for the world. You might go, oh, I get that. No, you don't get that because you're praying for the world. Every time you pray to God in this church, you pray for the world. Every time you pray to God in your daily devotions, you pray for the world. Every time you pray to God in your everyday encounters with the world, you're praying for the world. And God forbid that after this preaching, when you pray on this altar call, you'll still be praying for the world. I pray thee, God, let me keep this thing in my heart. I know that after preaching's over, I'm going to go back and do that worldly thing. I'm not sure if uh, what that preacher said is true about separation from the world in that part. And see, while we're spending time in prayer, contemplating on the Lord, you're praying. I pray thee, God, let me keep this. I pray thee, have me excused. You understand, God. This is for your glory. This is for a good reason. It's so difficult. And let me tell you something. Every time you pray God to keep the world, God is praying the opposite. No. Yeah. Amen. Who do you, whose prayer do you think God will answer? Yours or His? without any ill intentions. And I mean, it's not like you go into world because you're deliberately sinning or you have a thing against God. But deep down inside the heart, a disciple who loves Jesus, who tries to serve him and get involved in the ministry and do all that he can to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, deep down inside the heart, he's praying, God, not this one. Don't take that away. God, please, let me keep this a little longer. Oh, God, and you're praying deep down inside your heart. Deep down somewhere in that heart, it's praying. Even when you're hearing this preaching, some of you are doing that right now. Pray thee, God, not that one. I pray thee. I don't have to name it for you. I won't call it out. Don't worry. But you know what it is, and the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart, and you're praying. Oh, God, not that. No! 
not that, Lord. Let me keep it. And God is praying back to you, no. Why? Because we're talking about serious stuff here. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, if you're not careful, you're going to keep praying for the world and God to somehow mix together. That you get to keep both parties. Or you've probably been doing that, huh? You've been praying that, that way for a long, long time. Oh God, uh, let me have this, but that. I'll serve you, but this job. And Lord, this one, but my family. Lord, this one, but this worldly thing. And uh, uh. When you keep praying that way, if you're not careful, what's going to happen is... God will answer yes, not no. He will answer yes. And He will let you keep it. And if God answers yes, and you see God granting the prayer, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to think, oh, this is the right thing. This is God's will. So I'm going to keep this worldly thing, and I don't care if uh, other so-called anti-worldly Christians are going to judge me for that, criticize me. I'm going to keep this worldly thing while I serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because it's a good thing. And if you're not careful, it turns into a belief. Yes. And a belief means doctrine. Yes. And you're going to put that as your right doctrine, and you're going to believe in that false doctrine, thinking that it's a right doctrine. And you're going to live your whole life that way. And the way that you're living your whole life according to the customs of this world and how you integrate it with God is actually sick. And God don't want it. Don't believe it makes God sick? What did he say at Revelation 3? I would you were cold. So that's worldly. That's being out of the will of God. Or hot. Meaning all the way in God. Why? Because when you mix cold and hot together, it makes me sick and I want to throw up. That's what God said. Didn't you know that 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10, you hear about the prayer of Jabez. But this prayer is not a spiritual prayer. It's a selfish prayer. Lord, if you would increase my land, if you would give me riches, and do you know how many, like Pastor Donovan argued, yeah. I'm sick and tired of hearing so many false Bible teachers using that passage to justify praying selfish gains. Yeah. God, you know how those, uh, those Bible teachers thought that was right doctrine? To pray? Because Jabez thought it was right doctrine to pray that way. Because God answered it. If you're not careful, other people will follow that wrong doctrine with you in your selfish gain and because you kept arguing this is the will of God God's using me on this and other people will follow you down that trap hole and follow that wrong doctrine with you yes. Yes. how's your testimony huh okay. what's inside your heart I pray you God don't and then your everyday outward actions show that you can't hide it it shows the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It shows. And people are watching you, and they will follow you. While being deceived, thinking it's God's will. To combine that worldly thing you're holding on to with God. My third point is your preclusion to the world. Your preclusion to the world. Preclusion means uh, an exceptions, to be excluded from that. Well, can't you imagine how these disciples must have felt when you look at, I mean, look at John 17. Notice how the disciples must have felt. They must have felt really good about this. Go to John 17. Imagine Jesus said this to you at verse 6. Okay? This is about you, okay? I have manifested thy name unto the men. This is the people of Bible Baptist Church. And Jesus is saying, pretend Jesus is speaking about you. Pretend you're those disciples. Imagine how good you're going to feel. Thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were and thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word. Yeah. That's quite a compliment. Amen. When I hear some 
preachers who drop by our church give such nice compliments for our church when probably half of it is true. I don't know. <laughs> I hope all of it is true. But when they say stuff like, they keep the word of God. They're fired up. They're going to serve Jesus Christ. Oh, that stirs me up. But imagine Jesus Christ came to our meeting today and said, you all did a good job. You kept my word. Then you're going to go, man, that, whoa, you thought about running the bases after that. You feel so good. Oh, it just gets better. Verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Oh, that's great. Jesus says, I'm going to give you my words. I'm going to give you a task what you're going to do for me. You're going to go, yes, sir. I will do it, whatever it takes. Man, you, you talk about a compliment. Jesus, Jesus is saying, I only entrust you, not other people, just you. And you're like, yes, sir. I'm going to do that. Man, talk about a compliment. One in it. Man, that'll get you fired up. And then God continues at verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Wow, what if God said to Bible Baptist Church, can you imagine being those 12 disciples? Man, you manifested my glory. My glory spread out because of all the work that you've been doing, preaching my name and doing those miracles back during the apostolic times. And you would go, man, that's awesome if you were one of those 12 disciples. And then... Jesus Christ is saying, good job on this one, and you kept my word, and you gave glory to me. I mean, you are great people. Good job. And verse 12, man, it's great, man. Verse 12, why I was with them in the world. I kept them in thy name. Those thou gavest me, I have kept. Bible Baptist Church, I was with them. They kept uh, the things that you've entasked them, Lord. Bible Baptist Church is good, and none of them is lost except... Gene Kim, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Wow. Yeah, come on. I would go, I would be in shock mode if I was sitting in the audience and then Jesus Christ gave the compliments to our church and he said, except Gene Kim, I would go, what did I do wrong? <laughs> My heart would sink. Your heart would probably sink. Yes, sure. Man, can you imagine being there and Jesus said that and he said, your name. Except you. That's good preaching, brother. Bible Baptist Church, great compliment, good job. And you helped out the kitchen, you helped bring people to church, you're soul winning and stuff. Except, boom! And then called out your name. And you'd be, you'd be so embarrassed, upset, I don't know what the feelings would be. Maybe all mixture of negative emotions. But if Jesus said that, how much more so? Wow, that'd be bad. Yeah. You talk about, whew, that hurts. Why? Because these people were serious about being disciples for the Lord and not partaking with the world, but you still got something in you. That's why Judas couldn't go all the way. The son of perdition. The son of perdition is Judas right here. Why? Because the world was a little attractive to him. Those pieces of silver. There was something in the discipleship. He was discontented and he wanted something more. That's why testimony and the way it appears to others is so important. Because they're going to always keep that in mind. Do you realize this? When Jesus said, verse 6... Picture with me. Go back with me now. Verse 6 and then verse 8 and 10. Jesus Christ is complimenting the disciples right here. But do you realize when Jesus said in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men except the son of perdition. He's saying that to himself. Which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were uh, except the son of perdition. And thou gavest them me except the son of perdition. And they have kept thy word except the son of perdition. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, except Judas Iscariot. And they have received them, except Judas Iscariot. And have known surely that I came from thee, except Gene Kim. And they have believed that thou didst send me, except Gene Kim. Verse uh, 10, And all mine are thine, except Gene Kim. And thine are mine, except Gene Kim. And I am glorified in them, except Gene Kim. Wow. Do you realize when Jesus was saying all this statement in his mind, he was thinking, except name?
Have you ever heard people complimenting this church? Other brethren compliment this church? But do you realize when they're complimenting this church, they cannot separate, and no matter how good their heart and intention is, they cannot separate certain name in the mind. When they say, Bible Baptist Church is a soul-winning church, except name. Bible Baptist Church has a fired up zeal for the Lord, except name. Bible Baptist Church really is a friendly church and they care about people, except name. Do you realize it's not just Jesus, it's everybody, human nature, that thinks that way? Good preaching, brother. Man, you talk about feeling uneasy in the chair, right? After that? Uh, I might make it worse, so forgive me. <laughs> Some of you might shout, Amen, but I think everyone's pretty much under conviction. So, But let's suppose that some of you might shout amen, and you might say, that's real good preaching, preacher. Yes, we got to be separated from the world. we got to separate ourselves from the world. That's good preaching. But at the same time, you don't realize that you are that except amen. person. Amen, you don't realize that. You might say, oh, why is that? Well, let's first see why Jesus said except the son of perdition. Okay. If you look back at the passage right there, at verse 12, he said, Ex uh, but the son of perdition, right? So that's the exception, except the son of perdition. Okay, the only other mention of son of perdition, the only other mention, is found in 2 Thessalonians 2. So go over there. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now think about this. Jesus just don't conjure up titles. Oh, let's just call him uh, Son of Perdition. You know, No, Jesus has a reason for that title. So when Jesus Christ had in his mind Judas Iscariot, he said, except or but the Son of Perdition. Why? Why was Judas called the Son of Perdition? Well, the answer might be shown in this other passage, the only other passage on Son of Perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Look at this. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, where's the answer? Uh, look at behind the son of perdition. There's a comma, right? Meaning the previous words will support that. What does it say? That man of what? Sin. Sin. There's that ugly word. They got a sin issue. That Antichrist has a sin issue. Which is why he's given the title Son of Perdition. Now, that's what you got to realize is that maybe Jesus Christ, when he says, except the Son of Perdition, he's not just thinking as a title or holistically the person, but because of a specific sin issue that that person has. And because of that, he became the exception to everyone did good except so-and-so. Why? Not because holistically the person is worldly, but because they had a specific sin that so-and-so is still holding on to. And remember, Judas Iscariot is not contemporary Christian movement and came with tattoos and earrings when he was casting out devils and being a disciple of Jesus. He was dressed up in a tie, and a suit, had a King James Bible in his hand, and then made sure to preach negative and hellfire and brimstone without compromise, and knew all the right doctrines. But he's called son of perdition, except him. No, I did all, uh, no, I'm not a worldly person, I did everything right. No, because there's a specific sin, Judas, that you had, that made you an exclusion, preclusion. To the disciples. What is your sin issue that makes you the exception to you did a great job church except so and so because of specific sin. I think the disciples thought that way when Jesus said son of perdition because they didn't know it was Judas Iscariot. You know that? You and I know that which is why we're like Man, I'm glad he's not talking about me. But 
can't you imagine being the disciples? Jesus said, all of them are mine except the son of perdition. And the disciples are like, who's he talking about it? They weren't going, amen, good preaching, someone's messing up in the world. They didn't do that. You know what they were doing? Very likely they were thinking, is it I? They had a tie, suit, they King James Bible, right doctrines. I think they separated every sin in their life, yet they were still nervous and examined themselves and said, is it I? Isn't that what happened at Mark chapter 14? Jesus repeated that same thing in verse 18 through 19. One of you is a Judas Iscariot. One of you will betray me. One of you is that son of perdition. And the disciples didn't go, Amen, glory to God, preach it! No, they went, is it I? Why would they think, is it I? Because they're not thinking about, hey, I'm not a worldly person, like many of you Bible believers are thinking. Okay. They're thinking about, what did I do wrong? Yeah. Yes. What is it that I did wrong that will make me betray you, Jesus? Right. That will make me qualified That's as good. son of perdition? That's good. Is it because of the man of sin? 2 Thessalonians 2. A specific sin that you have. Do you become sorrowful and search yourself like these disciples when Jesus says, Oh, mine are thine. You did a good job. You're soul winning, Bible believing. You know all the right doctrines except... And when Jesus Christ does that, do you think about yourself? Or do you just say, Amen. Good preaching. We should be anti-worldly. So, Jesus can compliment you on your soul winning. Disciple you. You're a great disciple. You sacrificed everything and you separated from the world supposedly and no right doctrine. You dress right. You hear the right music. You do all the good things for Jesus Christ. Except, except, because you fail to keep tabs on yourself. When you look at your internet account and then you go, Oh, I have those images in my screen. Oh, they see my action history of what I went through and saw. And what I thought would be funny. Oh, because I failed to keep tabs when I was with my lost co-workers. And I laughed about something I shouldn't have laughed. I agreed and talked to them something I shouldn't have agreed or talked about. It's because you fail to keep tabs on when you look at your house another time and say, oh, you know, that thing is kind of worldly. When you look at your phone and whatever documents, images, files are inside, you go, you know, it is kind of worldly. It's easy for you to not see the world because you hide it. You privatize. But if you were to publicly reveal it to everybody, how would you feel? Makes you feel like that you're not a worldly Christian, huh? Or could it be, I just got too much world in me that I failed to keep tabs on. How do you do that? You need Jesus Christ to point out to you again. Accept and name the sin. And you need to go, is it I? Is it I? And then search. You think you're not a worldly Christian. <laughs> the disciples had better sense than you. Right. Someone's messing with the world. Someone's going to betray me for the world. And the disciples didn't say, I'm not worldly. I'm not going to betray you. Is it I? They had better sense. My fourth point is your point of view to the world. Your point of view to the world. This is not to neglect imaginations too, you know. Okay. You think you're not a worldly Christian, but Jesus Christ knows everything you thought of in your mind. Yes. And let's see if your brain, if it was played on a TV screen for everybody to see, if it's worldly or holy. 
had to throw that in there. Okay, so the fourth point. Your point of view to the world. Let's look at verse 14 through 15. 14 through 15. Now, this is uh, kind of weird, the wording here. Jesus said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh, if we read right here at verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Okay. Now, Christians, uh, basically what you see as gobbledygook right here, Jesus is saying, uh, don't take them out of the world, but they are not of the world. What does that mean? I thought we're supposed to be away from the world. What Jesus is saying is that you and I can't physically get out of this world. We're living here. But he doesn't want us to be a part of the world. So that's why he said we're not of the world, even though we can't get out of the world. All right, we Bible believers knew that one. Some of the others didn't, but most Bible believers knew about that. But I have a question right here. If we already know the distinction of out of the world and of the world, why didn't Jesus say that? I mean, look, look at right here, okay? Look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from of the world. Why didn't Jesus say that? Why did he put the evil there? Why not just of the world? Now, in your mind and my mind, we're thinking, well, it's pretty obvious, Pastor, because from of the world, just, just bad English. No, actually, in your Bible, the Bible says uh, Jesus Christ is from of old to everlasting. So from of can go together in the Bible. So Jesus Christ, I mean, look, Jesus Christ could have said of the world because of verse 14. He said of the world, of the world, of the world. Why didn't he say that verse 15? Unless there's a specific reason. Jesus said, no, I'm not going to call it of the world. I'm choosing my words carefully. I'm saying evil. Because if you were to tell a person, separate from the world person's like, what's wrong with that? But if you say separate from evil, the person will go, oh, all right, I'm going to clean house. Yeah. I'm going to change my behavior, actions, and you know what your problem is? Why you mix God and the world? You don't see it as evil. That's your problem. You see it as something good and beneficial, something that can work out with God. But God say, no, it's evil. It's heinous. But you don't see that. With the video games, the movies, and what you have in your history, and the, the, how you have in your home, and inside the secret files of the phone, and how you interact with people that nobody else knows about, that you lost track of. What was going on in your mind with the floods of imaginations that you lost track of? You don't realize that those things are evil, and you're committing evil every single day. You're a worldly disciple. But if you realized if it was heinous and wicked, it wouldn't be hard for you to separate from the world. You change how you dress. You, you change what you say. You change what kind of entertainment you'd hear and allow. But that's in Jesus' point of view about the world. It's evil. But not to you. You know why it's not to you? Because... Uh, you forgot the very first point. Studying, right? Remember, I mentioned about because you know the Word of God, that's why you can separate from the world and be a disciple of Jesus. You don't know much. You got to study the Word. You got to know the Word. That way you can see what is good and evil, what is right and wrong. And if you still don't know, now's the time to do so. Because if you don't, and you're going to remain brainwashed. And in your point of view, the world is just the world. It's normal. It's not evil. I mean, Jesus said that the very next verse, 16 and 17. Look at that. Jesus knew that if they knew the word, that they'd be clean, separated from the world. Look at verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify. What does sanctify mean? Separate from evil to holiness. Yeah. And the context was the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Word is truth. When you knew the truth about rock music, popular music, 
When you knew, knew the truth about the dressing of today, when you knew the truth about the stuff that they were putting on online and TV and the people's conversations and what they taught about equality, which may sound good, but it turned out to be evil itself, you know what happened? You said, stay away from me. That's evil. That's rotten. And you don't get offended if the preacher criticizes that. But why do people today get offended when the preacher criticizes that? I pray thee, let me have that little world. And I pray thee, God, you and the world can mix somehow together. My last point, your perfection to the world. Your perfection to the world. Now, if you, uh, if you had this, it would be easy to separate from the world. But let's be honest. We're human flesh and it's hard to separate ourselves from the world because that's just what the life we're so used to living and growing up in. Mm. Have you ever seen little boys when they ask about, you know, relationship or the topic of marriage is brought up? Then the little boy's like, yuck, I would never marry a girl. Ugh. I want to hang around with boys and just keep playing with my toys. And, you know, we all laugh about that. And the boy's like, ew, gross. And then you tell them, oh, no, you understand when you grow up. And then the little boy's like, huh, what? They don't understand. Give it 10 years, 15 years later, then 20 years later. And then later on, they, when they grow up, they fall in love. And then once they fall in such perfect love with that woman... They easily and naturally put the childish things behind. Oh, I want my toys and I'll never get married. No, they easily left that. They easily separated themselves from that and are willing to please that wife. Imagine living a whole life like that, but only perfect love can do that. And you as a child, when you hear about loving Jesus Christ and serving Him, the tendency of the world is an immature childish mindset. Oh, that's just, that's very difficult. And man, that's pretty extreme. And I don't think I could ever do that. But when you finally mature and grow up, and when you spiritually grow, your eyes get opened, and then you realize how childish and immature and foolish and vain the world was, that you left your worldly toys behind, child. And you said, this is just nothing. And then when you fell in love with someone who died for you, yeah. gave his life for you, and offered you perfect unity and a home in heaven, hey, why don't you live with me and be united with me? You fell in perfect love with such an awesome creator of the universe more than any celebrity and powerful, important leader combined. And when you fell in perfect love, you easily left that childish, worldly toys behind. That's how you separate from the world so easily is you have such perfect love for Jesus Christ. But it's difficult for us to have a perfect love for Jesus enough to leave the world. It is strange though that the disciples did, didn't they? They were able to do that. What's the difference? Verse 24, maybe Jesus answered why they were able to separate from the world. First of all, look at 23, though. 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be, what? Made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, and thou hast loved me. See, they were in that perfect love with Jesus. That's why they could easily leave the world behind. But how did they develop that? That's pretty hard for me and you to do sometimes. We're still immature and childish. It's just hard. Well, maybe Jesus gave a clue at verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Isn't that the context of verse 23, being perfectly united with Jesus to love with him? How do you become united with him unless you go to where he is? When you go to where Jesus is, you can fall in perfect love. But if you always don't go to where he is, 
and you always go to that world, that's why you can't fall in love. Unless you go to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I love you. Come give me a hug. What are you going to do? Hug the world and say, I love you too? Or are you going to go, I love you? And then give him a hug and come right here and leave the world at the same time. When you do that, that that's how you can fall perfectly in love. It's when you leave that world behind and come to Jesus, what would motivate me to leave this and go there? What did that verse 24 said? My glory. They see my glory. You see Jesus Christ, those nail-scarred hands and the, the whip back and the eyes full of love and said, I died for you. I love you. That world's going to kill you. Sin has a heavy price to pay. To pay. It's childish. It's immature. It's vain. I've got promises. I want to give you a good future. I want to provide your needs. I want you happy, not miserable. Why can't you trust me? I love you. And then just beholding that glorious thing would make me go, Oh, God, I'm sorry. And then I come to him and fall in love with him. Why could the disciples go to where Jesus is at? Because go to John 6. This is what the disciples knew. This is... The, what the disciples did that made them easily fall in perfect love with Jesus, made them easily stay away from the world once they've separated it and not struggle back and forth with two different loves with Jesus and the world. This is what they realized when they separated from the world and became disciples to follow him. John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Look at that. You can, for, you can quit your discipleship anytime. You can do that right now. You, you can leave the world and become a disciple of Jesus, but guess what? You can fall out and you can say, I'm not going to walk no more with you. You can do that if you want. Every man, woman, child has a free choice to get out of this church. No one's forcing you like public schools are and government. But anyway, but no one's forcing you. So what made the 11 stay? They could have left. Keep reading. Then said Jesus unto the 12, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? What does that mean, to whom shall we go? I mean, you and I, any time can go back to drinking. The gambling, fornication, sin, our job, our security, income, schooling, future plans. We can always go back there. So that's a dumb question. Simon Peter, you can just go back fishing. So why would he say, Lord, to whom shall we go unless he really means it? That there's nothing. I can't go back to fishing. It's gone. Because I quit that job, they're not going to have me back. I'm at a point of no return. Thou hast the words of eternal life. I knew too much. I believed too much. Every joyful experience and happiness that I had was not in the world. It was with you. That joy and happiness that I had in sin and the world, it's gone now. I can't go back even if I wanted to. That's the idea. I can't go back even if I wanted to because I can't recover it. What if Simon Peter meant it that way? To whom shall we go? Meaning that I can't go there. It's nothing. It can't be recovered. You know why you go back and forth and you're not like Simon Peter? You always have something to go back to in the world. You have that sin still there. You still got that thing on your iPhone and your flat screen TV. You got enough money to make the trip and encounter the people that you want. You're in a neighborhood with uh, bad people around you. You still got the connections. and You still got something to go back to. And that's the reason why you can't stay here. Because you're experiencing two joys, two happinesses. Oh, sin and... Oh, amen. Hail to the king we love so well, Emmanuel. Oh, flesh and oh, that feels good. And oh, that preaching convicted me. And you got two happinesses. You need that thing gone. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you that you can't go back now, even if you wanted to. 
Do you know what I'm talking about? I went too much into this church. I already had too many friends. My kids were raised here. I got a family and even everything that I've got. I'm so used to this style of living. I can't go back there. If I go back, it's, it's gone. I never experienced any happiness and joy. It's gone. Even if I want to go back, it'll be hard to get back that sin. It'll be hard to get back that flesh. It'll be hard to get back that world. And that's what you need to do. It needs to be unrecoverable. And God, and when Jesus offers you and tells you, hey, you can leave any time. You can go back to the world. I know following me is so hard and difficult. Attending Bible Baptist Church is very hard and difficult. Gene Kim is such a mean guy and he doesn't know what he's talking about. There are people in this church that just are imperfect and they criticize you behind their backs and whisper about you and the devil's going to attack you. Trial is so hard. I know. You can go back. Do you have a place to always go back to then? Or... No, Jesus. It's gone. Yeah, there's trials. There's pain. Sacrifice. People may talk bad about me, even in my own church. Pastor's not perfect. But I had too much fun here. I already developed a close family. I can't imagine a life leaving that. Because there's nothing, and I mean it, Lord. When I mean nothing, there's literally nothing out there. I can't go back. Maybe that's why they were able to truly separate from the world. Because the world is so separated that it vanished and it was annihilated and gone that they can't go back there. Come to Jesus. Fall in love with him. Nothing. Don't go back to your seat with something in the world. Let it be gone. Every head bow and every eye shut.